Hello and welcome back to MLab 1101, Introduction to Clinical Laboratory Science. My name is Dustin Scott Brewster, and this is going to be the third of our six-part presentation series on clinical laboratory testing. In this presentation, we're going to cover serology testing in the clinical lab. To find the objectives for this presentation, log on to Blackboard. On the left-hand side, select the Schedule tab. Scroll down to unit number five, and within that row, you'll find a link for the objectives for this presentation. So before we talk about serology, let's first talk about immunology. Immunology describes the function of the immune system. Immunology system protects us from pathogenic organisms like bacteria and viruses and parasites and things like that. The two major components of immunology include the innate or the natural immune system or reaction and the adaptive or specific immune system or reaction. First, let's talk about the innate immunity or innate reaction of the immune system. We have natural barriers such as your skin, mucous membranes and proteins that contribute to inflammation in the presence of a foreign body. Those are natural barriers of the immune system, as well as a cellular component of the natural immune system. Those include things like we mentioned in the last presentation, like neutrophils, monocytes, and eosinophils, which are all granulocytes and act as phagocytes in the cellular component of the innate immune system. The innate immune system is nonspecific and therefore does not require previous exposure to the antigen. We also have adaptive immunity. This is specific immunity, and there are two components of this type of immunity. There is a cell-mediated immunity, which is led by T lymphocytes that recognize cells as self or non-self. Think about this as a good cell or a bad cell. If it is a good cell, it's left alone and the T lymphocyte doesn't do anything to it. If it's a bad cell, the cell, the T lymphocyte, will attack the virally infected cell, a fungal element, tumor cells, or cells that have been infected with intracellular organisms such as chlamydia. We also have the humoral component of the adaptive immune system. This involves B lymphocytes developing into or maturing into plasma cells which produce immunoglobulins. An immunoglobulin is a fancy word for an antibody which attacks bacteria, toxins, and circulating antigens. So we don't need to know all of this, but just to give you an illustration and put everything together, we start up here at the top, the body becomes infected with a pathogen. We have the innate immune reaction, the cell-mediated reaction of the innate immunity, including monocytes, macrophages, neutrophils, and eosinophils. These are all phagocytes. These over here are going to attack the material. They're going to release their granules, which include cytokines, those cytokines include interleukins, tumor necrosis factor, and chemokines, which act to produce inflammation, fever, activation of complement, and increased vascular permeability, which attracts more immune cells to the site of infection. Just briefly, I mentioned the activation of complement. There's three different methods to activate complement. There's the classical pathway, alternative pathway, and the Mayo pathway. This provides bacterial immunity. It attracts more phagocytes to the site of infections and stimulates inflammation. So after they release their granules and cytokines, they digest the foreign material, the pathogen, and present that material to T helper cells. Once we get into the presentation of material to T helper cells, we're now in the adaptive immune reaction. You can see the adaptive immune reaction takes a little bit longer. It's not specific, but 
uh, it is, excuse me, it is more specific, but it takes a little bit longer. So once that material has been presented to the T helper cell, the T helper cell secretes full, more cytokines, which stimulate the production of memory T cells and attract macrophages and natural killer cells to the site of infection. T helper cells then activate B lymphocytes, which mature into plasma cells. Those plasma cells produce antibodies. Those antibodies bind to antigens, and that antigen antibody complex attracts C1 of the complement system to activate the classical pathway of complement. So we're coming full circle back around to complement. This looks like a really busy slide, and I know it's a lot to take in, but don't worry about any of that. Nobody's going to be tested on any of this material. What we want to focus on is the humoral reaction of the adaptive immune system. The humoral reaction is the production of antibodies, and that's what we're focused on in serology. So we have a primary antibody response, which occurs after the first exposure to an antigen. We have the secondary antibody response, where lymphocytes remember an antigen from a previous exposure, which provides a faster response time once exposed a second time. This is referred to amnestic response. A vaccine or an immunization work by producing this secondary antibody response. A, the period of time it takes for antibodies to be present in a patient's serum is known as seroconversion. When an antibody is present in a patient's serum who is previously negative for an antigen that you're testing for, and the time it takes to develop antibodies after exposure to that antigen, this is known as the period of seroconversion. So serology tests for the presence of these immune complexes in an immune reaction. So we have direct antigen testing that tests specifically for the antigen, as well as indirect testing. And this tests for the antigen antibody complex and is the more common test in a serology lab. Things that can act as antigens include transplanted tissue, bacteria, viruses, parasites, fomites, pollen, chemical, and toxins. Serology testing can be qualitative, and this is simply testing, is the antigen antibody complex present or is it not present? Is it positive or negative? And this simply tells if somebody has a disease or doesn't have a disease. Uh, and that is a qualitative test. Yes or no, true or false, positive or negative. That's qualitative. They're semi-quantitative, which helps determine the results that exceed a normal level of antibodies when a disease is not indicated. A good example of this is hepatitis B vaccines. Most people get their series of three hepatitis B vaccines when they're young, and they don't get them anymore the rest of their life. However, whenever you go work in a healthcare setting, it's important that you check the titer or your ability to fight off hepatitis B if you are in fact exposed to it. So rather than get another series of three hepatitis B vaccines, you can opt for a titer which measures the antibody concentration in your serum. And this is known as the titer and is a semi-quantitative serology test. So if we want to know more than is the disease present or not present, is the patient positive or negative, and we want to know how much is there, that's called a quantitative test. A quantitative serology test is used for people, uh, for example, that possibly are known to be HIV positive or hepatitis C positive, and we know they're positive already, so we don't need a qualitative test. We need a quantitative test. We want to know how much virus is present in the patient's serum. This is known as a patient's viral load and is an example of a quantitative serology test. The way serology testing works begins with collection in a red gold or tiger top tube. 
that sample is allowed to clot, so we don't have any clotting factors left in the sample. It's then spun down. The liquid portion of a clotted specimen is serum, and then that serum is mixed with a commercial antigen similar to the target pathogen, and that antigen is also labeled with a fluorescent radioisotope or latex B tag. And if the antibody is present in the patient's serum, then the reaction will agglutinate and be visible because of the tag that the antigen is previously labeled with. So here's an example of an immune reaction. Types of disorders of the immune system include autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus or lupus, type 1 diabetes is considered an immune disease, as well as myasthenia gravis. Hypersensitivities or allergies of the immune system include hay fever, asthma, and dermatitis. Malignancies can also be tested in the serology lab, including leukemias, lymphomas, or multiple myeloma. Acquired immunodeficiencies include infections, systemic disease, malignancies, drug reactions, and irradiation. Congenital immunodeficiencies tested for in the immunology lab, uh, congenital meaning you're born with it, include DeGeorge syndrome, A gamma globulinemia, and severe combined immunodeficiency. So that's going to cover the third of our six-part presentation on clinical laboratory testing. We will pick this back up with part four of clinical laboratory testing.